and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Building and Implementing an FR Program for the Arc Flash Hazard. My name is Kate Bechtold. I'm Assistant Editor of The Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all listeners for attending today's event and especially Bulwark Protective Apparel for sponsoring this webinar. Our presenter today is Derek Singh, the Technical Training Manager at Bulwark Protective Apparel. Derek has been involved with the flame-resistant clothing industry for over 20 years. For the first 10 years of his career, Derek worked directly with end users developing and implementing flame-resistant clothing programs specific to the customer's hazards. Over the past 11 years, Derek has worked closely with Fortune 1000 companies, educating them on the various fabrics, FR technologies, and the dynamics of art flash and flash fire hazards as they look to develop FR clothing programs. In his current position as a technical training manager, Derek has developed over 40 hours of training curriculum for Bulwark University. These training efforts cover all aspects of FR clothing. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Derek. Well, thank you, uh, Kay, for that kind introduction. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're listening to us today. So let's get started, because in the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to kind of touch on some of the, the key areas to uh, building and implementing a flame-resistant clothing uh, program for the arc flash hazard. We're going to uh, touch a little bit on, on what the hazard is. We'll get into some of the regulations, the laws that help guide us here, and then the standards that really kind of move us or coach us to be in the right direction, and then we'll look at some best practices uh, in this key area. So with that, uh, let's get moving. So why do we need flame resistant, and in this case, arc rated clothing? Well, obviously the severe burns and all the fatalities associated with this hazard come directly because of clothing ignition. Clothing ignition is what causes ultimately catastrophic body burn, which unfortunately leads to uh, fatality. So flame resistant arc rated clothing self extinguishes. And that's all it does. But by doing that, regardless of the technology, by self extinguishing, we take away a large majority of the potential burn injury. And by reducing the amount of burn injury, the severity and the extent about, uh, of burn injury, we dramatically alter the outcome for, for the wear. So that's why flame resistant arc rated clothing is important, but all it does is self-extinguish, puts itself out. We have to, when we are talking to our end user community, we have to coach them up on a couple of key things. The first thing we have to get people to understand is this is secondary protective apparel. So let me explain that real quick. Primary protective clothing or primary protective apparel is really under, easily understood when you think of Firefighters. Think of a firefighter, big red truck, flashing red lights, rolls up to a structural fire. That firefighter gets off his truck and more than likely he's already donned a good portion of his PPE. He's got on the upper half of his bunker gear, the lower half of his bunker gear. He's already got his rubber boots on. He's probably slipping into specialized gloves. He's donned his really cool hard hat, and then most importantly, on his back and ultimately around his face, he has his respirator. He then grabs a pole axe and voluntarily walks into a burning building. How is he able to do that? Two primary reasons. First, he's a firefighter. That's what he's trained to do. Secondly, he trusts his PPE. His PPE is designed for long-term thermal exposure, and with that breathing apparatus he has on, he's able to be inside that thermal event for an extended period of time. Now, when that fire is put out and they get back on that truck and they go back to that station house, does he need to still be wearing all that PPE? Absolutely not. It is designed to be task-based. They are knowingly going into a thermal event, so they're going to don their PPE. In our world, where our 
end users, the people working in the arc flash hazard area, it's secondary. It needs to be worn all the time. Why? Because we don't know when these events are going to happen. These are accidental thermal exposures. We do not design electrical equipment to blow up. Now, that being said, they do blow up. They fail. About 35,000 times a year, we will have an arc flash occur in our electrical systems in the United States. About 7,000 of them, we're unfortunately unfortunate enough to be in front of one where it injures us. Of those 7,000, 2,000 serious enough uh, to send us to a burn unit, and ultimately, unfortunately, a good chunk of those 2,000 will end up in a fatality. You are not impervious to injury by wearing arc-rated flame-resistant clothing. We still have to look at the hierarchy of controls. Obviously, we want to eliminate or replace the potential for an arc flash event. If we can't eliminate or replace it, engineer it out. If we can't engineer it out, have administration and policies in place to where we minimize the exposure. But at the end of that hierarchy is our PPE. And our PPE has to be donned properly and it has to be worn correctly in order to protect us if we still have an accident. Think about it this way. Another great analogy when we talk about engineering and we talk about advancements in safety, think about our auto industry in the last five years. We have seen some fantastic engineering for safety in the automobile industry. In fact, if you look at this little smart car, it's got a titanium frame to protect the occupants. We have airbags now, not just at the steering wheel. We have passenger airbags, side rear airbags, airbags that'll pop out of the side of the seats. That's all fantastic engineering. We have side view mirrors that will alert us if there's something in our blind spot. Some of them even are sophisticated enough that we'll not allow the vehicle to move in that direction if there's something in the blind spot. We have cars with sensor arrays today that it'll park for you, it'll break for you. All that engineering is fantastic. That all being said, why do we still rely on 70-year-old technology? In fact, we don't just rely on it. It is mandated by law that it is worn. In fact, if any of you are driving company vehicles or have colleagues that drive company vehicles, guaranteed in the language of that company vehicle agreement is you have to wear your safety belt. Surrounded with all this great engineering, why is that 70-year-old technology still viable? Because it's a proven life-saving piece of equipment. It is your last line of defense when everything else fails. When all that engineering goes kaput, you have this proven life-saving piece of equipment to rely on. Because no matter how bad it is on this side of the windshield, it's better than 20 feet down that asphalt. Ask any highway patrol officer the survivability of ejection accident. It's virtually nil. Your arc-rated flame-resistant clothing is your last line of defense if there's an arc flash incident. Because all that other engineering, everything else obviously has failed if there's indeed an arc flash. We used, to, we used to, and when I say we, us here at Bulwark, when we do these presentations, we used to roll out article after article after article, because believe it or not, they are relatively common and easy to find because they're still happening every single day in the United States. That being said, we don't do that as much anymore because with the Google box, a lot of people can go find that information on their own. With that, though, I still share this article for a number of reasons. In the first paragraph, you have the date, 2004. That's four years after NFPA 70E came out, which is the NFPA standard on electrical, working on energized electrical equipment and working on it safely. In 2000, they said that you have to adopt, and 2000 terminology was flame-resistant clothing to protect against an arc flash hazard. So four years after the fact is this article. We have an electrician working on an energized HVAC system in a school. 
The second paragraph, unfortunately, is a quote from the medical examiner. That's the coroner. There was a spark igniting this electrician's clothing. He ultimately became a fatality from clothing ignition, which caused catastrophic body burn. For lack of a $50 shirt and a $50 pair of pants that have flame-resistant, self-extinguishing properties, you have a fatality. For lack of a $50 shirt and a $50 pair of pants, you have an electrical worker who became a statistic. And that, unfortunately, is the reality in many cases. So that being said, what is the, the counter to that? In this picture here in front of you, you see blown up electrical equipment. We have had an arc flash incident happen in this cabinet of meters. Fortunately, in this case, we have an electrical worker who was wearing his PPE. Now, in this case, this is a snapshot of some of that PPE. You see his safety glasses. You see his rubber gloves for shock protection. You see one of his leather, leather protectors. And then you see his shirt. His shirt is singed. His shirt is still primarily intact because his shirt was able to withstand that energy, not ignite because it had flame-resistant properties and self-extinguished. This next picture, and we'll address this in the coming slides, is one of the concerns. What do you wear underneath your flame-resistant arc-rated clothing? This electrical worker at the time was wearing what is correct, 100% cotton. Now the concern is, even though he's correctly wearing 100% non-flame-resistant cotton underneath his flame-resistant shirt, which by the standards and by the training is correct, you'll notice some singeing here, charring. The charring is precursor to ignition. Fortunately, there wasn't enough additional energy in this particular incident to potentially ignite that shirt and cause injury, it did not in this case, and we have something that could have been catastrophic is indeed was survivable. The person wearing that shirt was in observation for 72 hours at a local hospital, went back to work that week, and is still working at that utility where the incident occurred. What does our law say? Well, if we look at our law, particularly at our utility side, Back in 1970s, early 1970s, the law didn't give electrical workers much direction at all. It even allowed, in many cases, wearing heavyweight cotton uh, on the work site in this hazard. It didn't get much better in the early 90s. It did clarify some things, saying don't wear anything that would melt. Don't wear nylons, rayons, polyesters. And in fact, it even gave a weight category to the heavyweight cotton that could be used in front of this hazard. The downside to this was you can easily find 12 ounce, 14 ounce uh, denim, but find an 11 ounce or heavier work shirt that's not called a jacket, good luck. So even then, you couldn't satisfy the law in non-FR because you couldn't find heavier weight enough shirts to satisfy the actual law. So here we are, fast forward uh, to 2014, we actually changed the law. The regulation changed and it was announced that we are going to have flame resistant arc rated clothing for electrical workers working in and around energized equipment on our power lines, our power generation facilities, and even up to the meter. So that was all good. So what was the justification for that? The bottom line is they determined that roughly 20 lives are going to be saved per year and just a little over 100 serious injuries annually will be prevented by just improving the PPE. So where does that leave our utility community today? Well, the majority of our utilities are wearing eight calories of uh, protection or more in front of these arcs already, or what is commonly known as CAT2 protection, that's NFPA 70E terminology, but it is applicable here. Uh, what changes would you have to make if all your equipment is eight calories or less? Uh, and that's the measurement of the equipment if it explodes. So what you have 
to make an adjustment for is if you do an engineering study and you determine that your electrical equipment, if it fails, will produce incident energy measured in calories per centimeter squared of X, then you have to make the determination in your PPE, which has a arc thermal protection value of X measured in calories per centimeter squared, you want your garments to have more calories of protection than the incident energy coming out of the equipment. So that being said, if your equipment, if you do your determination, your calculations of your equipment, and you determine that it's eight calories or less, you probably don't have to do anything. Now, you may find that during your engineering study that some of your equipment is going to produce more than eight calories of incident energy, then what do you do? You have a couple of options. First and foremost, getting further away from the equipment is going to help. So if you don't currently use uh, hot sticks, maybe going to a hot stick and recalculating will reduce the amount of energy that potentially could get to your electrical worker. If that's not an option, then layering up or providing additional garments, okay, in a layered fashion will provide additional uh, protection. So why is layering to meet the hazard in electrical kind of important? Well, what you wear underneath, as you saw in the earlier slides, is extremely important. On the top of this slide, you'll see a picture, and hopefully you'll be able to see what has occurred on that person's body. You'll see some uh, extreme scarring. That scarring is from melted plastic. Now. The melted plastic was from the undergarment that he was wearing underneath his arc rated shirt. His arc rated shirt did exactly what it was supposed to do. It self extinguished, put itself out after the short term thermal event. The rest of that energy melted his 100% polyester performance athletic wear to his skin. Those scars were caused because he had to go to a burn unit and have that plastic removed over about a 30-day period. Break open, okay, where we have the failure of the outermost layer is also uh, very uh, common. The lower picture is actually uh, the energy from the equipment exceeding the protection or the insulative uh, protection of the actual garment itself. So you have too much energy, not enough protection. Well. How do, we, how do we minimize both those? Well, first and foremost, we train our people that they can't just wear anything underneath their arc-rated flame-resistant clothing. Secondly, we build a system that can actually uh, stand up to the energy as a combination, as combined together, we can actually get more protection from two lightweight layers than we potentially could get from one heavier layer. So layering up eliminates two major problems. One, it eliminates our safety professionals, our supervisors, those in charge of what their people wear from having to inspect undergarments. What you'll see with all the commercially viable base layers today is you'll see some kind of logo identification at the neck. Why is it strategically put there? Because then it's easier for the foreman, the supervisor, that safety professional to scan his crew and easily see that they're wearing the proper undergarments. Why? Because even though we allow natural fibers in the standards like cotton, um, wool, uh, is another for our colder months that we're entering into. But even a natural fiber like cotton, which is allowed in the standard, we don't necessarily know just because we see a white V at the neckline there from that 100% cotton undergarment, we cannot categorically say each and every time, every single person that's 100% cotton. It could be 80-20, it could be 50-50, it could be 65-35, it could be a myriad of different uh, combinations of uh, fibers in order to produce a white t-shirt. And that's really all you're looking at is a white t-shirt because that's really all you know that they have underneath. You can't just by the color know that it's going to be 100% natural fiber. FR base layers allow you to then easily, as I said, scan your crew and determine if they're wearing uh, the correct gear. 
Secondly, it eliminates the concern of break open. Remember, going back to that electrical worker a few slides earlier, you saw his khaki shirt, you saw where the singeing was, and then we kicked to the next slide, you saw some charring on his 100% cotton undergarment. Having a FR base layer eliminates any concern of having enough energy passing through there where you could potentially ignite that cotton uh, undergarment. So layering to meet the hazard, regardless of the thermal hazard, whether it's an arc flash or, or, or a flash fire, natural fibers are allowed. But natural fibers may not provide adequate protection if, if you have thermal energy that exceeds the protection of that outermost layer. So if the outermost layer starts to fail, what you have underneath now becomes even more uh, prevalent within that uh, safety system. Our standards all talk to uh, providing additional protection, being aware of what our uh, underneath layer is made of, and also can it add to the protection. The only way that it can add to the protection is that base layer has to also be uh, flame resistant. And in case of electrical arc flashes, it has to be arc rated. So 1506 talks to, it's reasonable, it's recognized that to optimally protect our electrical workers, having additional layers of flame resistant arc rated clothing would be beneficial. In NFPA 70E, again, that's the standard for general industry electrical work. It provides a whole annex uh, in the back of the book on protecting your people with uh, layered systems. Also, Dr. Thomas Neal testified in the final rule for 1910-269, which was the recent revision of the regulation that adopted arc-rated clothing for electrical workers in transmission, distribution, power gen, and metering, went on to say that you benefit from arc-rated uh, clothing. So which base layer is going to be correct for your application? Is long sleeve going to be the answer? Can short sleeve work? Well, if you are utilizing the com combination, if you're going to create a layered system where you're going to calculate or have calculated for you what those two arc ratings together, what level of protection you're going to have from two layers and indeed create a system, then it has to be long sleeve. If you're looking just to provide additional protection, okay, and if you're looking just to eliminate uh, potential uh, cotton ignition if you do have break open, or if you're looking just to provide uh, or take that out of the equation, then you can go with short sleeves, but you're only going to benefit from the most, the outermost layers arc rating. You can't have a arc rated system with a short sleeve base layer. Uh, Bulwark's done some uh, homework for you here. We have over 150 different combinations of our top layer, our long sleeve base layer, and what those arc ratings are when they're combined. Uh, in this example here, you have a outer layer, which is 6.3 calories of protection by itself. You have a base layer, which is 6.4 calories of protection by themselves. But when they are layered together, that system is 24 calories of protection. So if you go back to our example of what do we do with equipment to where it exceeds what the outer layer is, you could work on uh, higher rated systems utilizing these types of combinations. Now, one thing you want to stay cautionary of is your system is the lowest ATPV in that system. Your pants are part of that system. So if your pants have a calorie rating of 18 and you're wearing this uh, long sleeve base layer and this long sleeve outer layer system, you're not 24, you're 18. So just remember to take that into account, that it's not just the upper layer, it's the lowest ATPV in your system, and in many cases that's going to be uh, the arc rating uh, of your pants. 
training is very, very uh, important. In fact, uh, 1910-132 speaks extensively in and around training when it comes to PPE. And yes, shirts, pants, and coveralls, when they have an ARC rating, when they are being implemented here, are PPE. So we have to train our people on how to properly don and doff. That's our fancy way of saying putting them on and taking them off. Uh, we have to have our employees be able to demonstrate to us that they understand how to properly wear uh, their arc-rated flame-resistant clothing, and then we have to obviously document those. So some simple do's and don'ts, and hopefully this is just primarily a review, and if it's not review, hopefully it'll uh, maybe next time you're out looking at your teams, a uh, couple things here might catch your eye that you'll be able to correct. So if we have a shirt and pant, this is a properly donned uh, shirt and pant, uh, buttoned, tucked, and uh, sleeves rolled down. These are some common don'ts that we see in the field. Uh, we'll see the sleeves rolled up because what? These things are too hot to wear properly. We'll typically see them untucked. Sometimes it's the ergonomics, it's a poorly designed garment and every time these guys reach up to grab something, their shirt comes popping out. Uh, of their waistband. Uh, they've had fabric shrinkage uh, over time because uh, whatever they're, the manufacturer, whatever fabric they're using uh, has shrunk up on them. Whatever the case may be, these are serious don'ts. Uh, thermal energy does a great job of obeying uh, the laws of thermal dynamics and hot air will rise. If that arc flash happens to hit the ground and mushroom, all that energy will then come from the ground up underneath your uh, FR arc rated shirt, blousing it up, that thermal energy will pass through. And if you happen to be wearing a lightweight 100% cotton t-shirt, you could potentially be putting it uh, to the ignition point. So we wanna make sure we're wearing this stuff correctly. A Couple of other things to think about, especially out in the field. A Couple of things here, especially with weather changing. Uh, that jacket, yes, is now the outermost layer. That has to be arc rated. Uh, what about that gray hoodie that you see sticking out on that particular slide in that picture? Once it's outside, as it's deployed here, guess what? That's the outermost layer. Is that hoodie arc rated? If it's not, it should not be worn, and it definitely should not be worn in the configuration that we see here. Could it potentially be worn if it's 100% natural fibers? Could you wear a non-FR sweatshirt uh, underneath that jacket? Yeah, you could technically have a 100% cotton sweatshirt underneath there. But if you take that jacket off during the day, guess what? That sweatshirt's now your outermost layer and that sweatshirt would then have to be arc rated. One other thing that we need to obviously be conscious of when we're developing these programs and we're policing these programs, what about headgear? What are you putting on your head? Uh, what about that fleece beanie that you're gonna wear in the upcoming cold months? That too now has to be uh, flame resistant. That too needs to be made of at least fabric that has uh, an arc rating to it. So just things that you need to be conscious of when you're looking at the overall program. These are some small areas where you can have a huge investment in your arc rated FR clothing and you could potentially be jeopardizing it uh, just by those two uh, small examples that sometimes slip by. So wearing the correct base layers under your uh, FR AR garments is important. Uh, wearing your FR AR garments is, uh, correctly is equally important. Uh, Two lightweight uh, layers potentially could give you more protection than a single heavier uh, layer. Why is that uh, something to consider? One of the pushbacks you, you can get when implementing a flame resistant arc rated clothing program is these are hot and heavy. You can counter that by providing two lightweight layers and uh, by testing them together or getting those test results from the manufacturer, you may be even uh, providing more protection and having greater adoption because they're lighter and more comfortable. Care and maintenance. Probably the, the last piece we're gonna talk about here today, but probably one of the most important pieces. Uh, 
we, we see in what we do, because this is all we focus on, we see a lot of citations coming from uh, our uh, OSHA side of the business on improper care and maintenance of uh, flame-resistant and arc-rated clothing. Uh, this is now PPE. It has to be cared for, uh, maintained correctly, and it has to be clean and usable. So in order to do that, we are required to tell you how to take care of, uh, of your uh, flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. We do that uh, in the labeling. Uh, we will provide clear, concise directions on how to do that. Uh, if you're unable to read those labels, you can always get PDFs uh, from your manufacturers. Uh, it's something that's very, very common. Uh, that the manufacturers will do is provide clear guidance on how to care for this stuff. It's not rocket science, though. Uh, you're not required to uh, have a third party take care of these. Uh, that's entirely up to you. You're able to take care of this stuff at home if you choose to do so. In many cases, uh, logistics uh, require folks to take care of their stuff at home. That being said, wash them separately. Uh, Turn garments inside out if you want to improve color retention. Um, use uh, only liquid detergents. Make sure your liquid detergents do not contain any chlorine or peroxide. Uh, chlorine is pretty easy to figure out. Peroxide is a little bit trickier, but just be careful of anything that says oxy. Uh, don't have any oxy clean in there. Uh, that's one of the ones that kind of uh, has recently been in the marketplace. That's one of the ones that kind of catch folks. We don't want to use chlorine or peroxide when cleaning our flame-resistant clothing. Avoid the hottest temperatures uh, on your, your wash cycle. Uh, for tough stains, uh, use shout, use uh, products like that is fine. Uh, let things soak overnight uh, in detergent, but don't let them soak overnight in things like peroxide, oxyclean, or chlorine. Don't use dryer sheets and don't use fabric softener in, on the liquid side of it. Uh, and then tumble dry on low sleddings. In many cases, you can just hang dry these and they're going to last you uh, a long time and you can ensure that nothing's going to uh, impede those uh, FR properties uh, if you care and maintain them properly. So those are the, uh, a couple of the big things. Uh, the three big tips are, as we mentioned it numerous times now, no chlorine, no peroxide, stay away from fabric softener. Do not wear if they're soiled with flammable contaminants. Now, is that realistic on the job site if you're going to get secondary accelerants? No. The reality is, though, we do need to remove you from the hazard. If you're, uh, for example, in utility and you're in a bucket and you have secondary accelerants, get out of the bucket, get down on the ground and put someone else in the bucket. Uh, unless you can change out of that garment and get into a new garment or a clean garment that doesn't have secondary uh, accelerants on it. Uh, retire the garments if they're worn out. And good common sense uh, on what means when a garment's worn out. And we'll show you some, uh, some pictures here shortly. Monitor the, that accumulation of secondary accelerants on a daily basis and throughout your workday. Uh, you may, have a, you may have a colleague who's got a big oil smear, grease smear across his back. He may not be able to see it. Help him out. Let him know that uh, his PPE has been compromised temporarily and make sure he's not going into harm's way. That being said, discoloration or stains alone are not indicators that you have reduced uh, protection. If garments are stained, for example, this picture here on the left, if that is just staining, if that garment is starting out its workday and it's clean and it does not smell of secondary accelerant, then that garment is still FR. That is just staining. Now, during the workday, if that is secondary accelerant, AKA it smells like fuel, it is fuel. Your FR properties will be compromised. Just because you're wearing FR does not stop fuel from burning. If that is fuel, it will ignite and burn until that fuel is gone, nullifying the FR properties in that area. Do not wear garments that have secondary accelerants. Secondly, if it comes back quote unquote clean and it smells like fuel, guess what? It is fuel. Do not wear that garment, launder that garment until that fuel odor is gone. And if you can't get rid of the fuel odor, get rid of the garment. Uh, the one on the right, 
Again, if that's staining and that garment's clean, you're fine. If you're going through the work day and that is the amount of secondary accelerant that's on you, you will have hot spots. That's up to you whether you choose to continue to work uh, in that area. Uh, if that is fuel and there is a thermal event, those small areas, that fuel will be uh, burned up. You will have what we call in the business a hot spot. Uh, basically, the FR in that area will not work. Will you uh, potentially cause second and third degree burns under there? Uh, you'll probably get some blistering, probably not third degree, but uh, the FR around it would self-extinguish, but you're just going to have hot spots in that area. Again, entirely up to you and your training and what you all decide to do on minimal staining like that. Uh, here's the uh, usual suspects. You see your OxyClean, you see your fabric softener, uh, you see your chlorine, starch, uh, dryer sheets. The one in the middle there is your liquid tide. That's what we want you using. Uh, we don't, we're not endorsing tide per se. Uh, that's just the easiest one, and people recognize that a lot. There's no additional additives. It's just liquid detergent. So back to uh, holes, rips, and tears. Inspect your garments daily. Check areas of stress. Look along the seams. When you get up and you're getting ready to don your PPE, think about it as you would your safety harness. Think about it as you would fall protection. Run, run a quick eyeball check over those major stress areas. Make sure everything's intact. Make sure you got all your buttons, zippers, everything is working the way it's supposed to. This is PPE. And uh, make sure it's going to provide you the protection that uh, hopefully you don't need, but if you do need it, then it's all there. Visually, things to think about. What we tell folks is anything greater than a nickel as a whole, don't repair it. Anything longer than three inches, don't repair it. Now, you look at that rip on that pant uh, on the left there, that's on the seam, but that's far greater than three inches. I wouldn't be repairing that, I'd be replacing it. That rip is not on the seam. That rip is greater than the size of a nickel. Again, this is don't mess with the integrity of your PPE. Get new ones. Thread barren. On the right there, those elbows are worn through to where you see the actual composition of that fabric. That's a no-no. That can't be repaired. That needs to be replaced. Uh, again, you're going to have to make a choice. Is that rip less than three inches on that seam? If you can, if it is, and you want to repair it, guess what? That's Nomex thread you have to utilize. You have to utilize uh, Nomex or Aramid thread in order to make that repair. You can't just grab the thread needle off your uh, sewing machine and attempt to make that repair. You have to have the proper uh, repairs uh, like fabrics and Nomex or Aramid threads. So uh, proper use simplified. Your arc rate FR clothing, make sure it's appropriate to the hazard. We, worst thing we can do for uh, compliance, worst thing we can do for acceptance is overprotecting, having way too much protection for the actual hazard. How does that end up in the field? We're wearing really heavy shirts. We're wearing really heavy pants. People aren't happy about it. And guess what? When we look into those programs, they're wearing 15, 20 calories of protection for uh, five to seven calories of exposure. Doesn't need to be done that way. Make sure it's always the outermost layer. Make sure that you are prepared for the elements if need be. Uh, make sure you wear correctly that is zipped, buttoned, uh, etc. All natural, non-melting undergarments, and if you're going to do that, better yet, uh, go to uh, FR arc rated base layers. Watch and make sure your garments are clean. Make sure you're monitoring can contaminants throughout the day. And then if you do repair them, make sure they're repaired correctly. If you can't repair them, remove them from service. Just a quick reminder, uh, in this picture here, we have a sticker that adorns a hard hat uh, in a Southern California utility, uh, primarily for the reason that we see on the right. What we see on the right is a arc rated FR shirt that worked perfectly. Unfortunately, this electrician had rolled it up, removed his rubber gloves for shot protection, removed the leather protectors that were on those rubber gloves, and went into that MCC that he had de-energized. He failed to verify, and it was still energized. The resulting arc flash, you can see the injuries uh, that were sustained because of that. 
Real quick, I know we're getting close on time and I do want to save some time for some questions, but just a quick bonus slide here for you all. We are getting going into uh, the winter here. Some of you, uh, depending on where you are, may already be in the midst of winter. Some of you have may already gone through your fall and rainy season, so may be in the middle of it. That is your outermost layer. If you are putting your uh, folks out in the elements, that rain gear has to be arc rated rain gear if that's your hazard. It has to be flash fire rain gear if that's your hazard. Be very, very careful of rain gear that has only one standard that determines that it's flame resistant. It will be marketed as FR. It says it's FR because it meets ASTM 2302, for example. That standard has been withdrawn and is being reviewed currently because it is being widely misused by manufacturers because that FR rain gear has not been tested to the standard, hence it will fail in most cases. For example, if you have rain gear that meets 6413, 6413 is the vertical flame test. It is the, one of the precursors to determining FR uh, properties in fabric. It is by no means the end-all, be-all. It is a starting point. If that is the only test method to claim flame resistance in your rain gear, your rain gear will fail. That is not a performance standard. Lastly, NFPA 701. We don't typically see this in rain gear. Where we see this standard is in our high-vis vests. A lot of folks now require their people when they're outside to wear ANSI vests so they can be seen. Those vests are now the outermost layer. They have to be flame resistant arc rated. If it is NFPA 701, that is not even a garment standard. That is a fabric standard for the hospitality industry, primarily for linens and drapes. We see that a lot in 100% polyester, high-vis vests that they market as flame resistant. So be very, very cautious. Your vests and your rain gear have to say 1891 or 2733. Uh, they can also, for vests, they can also say 1506. They can say 19, uh, excuse me, NFPA uh, 2112 uh, for your high-vis vests. So just something, again, to think about and take home. So as we conclude here, kind of wrapping things up, some key points that I always like to share people when they're looking to uh, either enhance, complement their current program, or they're looking to build a program. No matter who you're evaluating, ask for that manufacturer's guarantee in writing on letterhead and sign. Why do I say that? The guarantee and how that guarantee is worded is very, very important. Make sure it is not guaranteed around any standard. First and foremost, our standards are awesome, our standards are great, but our standards are a minimum. They are a minimum performance standard typically, and we can do way better than just the standards. But if we're not even meeting the standards, then where are we? That being said, if the guarantee is just around the standard, ASTM 1506 standard, for example, is 25 launderings. Are you ever going to launder a garment more than 25 times? Hopefully you do. What happens on a 26th laundering? That guarantee is no longer uh, valid because it said it's guaranteed to ASTM 1506. Ask for the test data. Test data should be easily acquired from top reliable manufacturers. Make sure the certifications are valid. Within five clicks of a mouse, you can verify any certification. Why do I say that? I have seen garments marketed, and I've seen the certifications claiming that it tested at X. When we go back to the test organization and we ask for verification of that, it is drastically different than what is being uh, published. So be cautious of that. Do a little bit of homework. Specify that only certified compliant garments for your hazard are allowed on the job site. That's, that's, that one's relatively easy. It sounds like it makes common sense, but there is so much stuff out there today that programs can easily, easily start becoming out of compliance because you just start accepting everything into the program and you're not really policing it. 
work with proven supply chain partners. I say that to say this, we're all perfect when nothing happens. We all are, where the rubber meets the road and your supply chain partners really earn their coin is when unfortunately something happens. Are they able to provide data on that garment? Can they trace that garment to uh, where it was manufactured, when it was manufactured, what role of fabric it came off of, and what are the test results from that role? Can they verify at the micron level how that fabric worked? Do they have the resources to tell you how hot it got? Were there any secondary contaminants? And did the FR technology work as it was designed to work? So look for proven supply chain partners. And then lastly, periodically police your program for compliance. With that, I think we've got some time left. Uh, I'm gonna turn this over to Kay for some questions. But before I do that, if we don't get to your question today, uh, I will get those questions that will be attached to a way for me to get a hold of you via email, and I will make sure that everybody gets their question answered. If you ask me a question today and I do not have the answer for it, I will find a way and get you that answer uh, shortly. So with that, again, I thank everybody for their time. And Kate, let's answer some questions. Okay, thanks, Derek. Uh, it looks like we have just under 15 minutes for questions. Uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send it to all panelists. Um, our first question comes from Dale. He asks, uh, do you have any experience with or recommendations for cooling vests worn under the FR garments? Great question. Um, the tough thing with the ones that I have seen today and uh, my concern with is what's the actual cooling gel and what's the actual cell that that cooling gel or whatever's providing the cooling piece, what's that made out of and has it been tested in your hazard? For example, just slipping those cool jet packs into an FR fabric holder uh, sounds in theory that it may work, but until someone actually takes that to uh, Connectrix and tests it and shows that that gel portion in and of itself will uh, remain intact, will not melt, drip, and potentially injure the wearer, I haven't seen anybody do that. So what we tell people is don't wear them. Uh, until they have something to where they have the test data that shows that it's been tested in the hazard and it will not uh, cause injury, don't wear them. Uh, follow uh, OSHA's guidelines, take regular breaks, take, uh, get hydrated, get in the shade. Uh, if it's somewhere, for example, where you provide uh, refrigerated cooling huts, use those. Uh, I would stay away from those cooling type vests until we can show that they will not uh, cause injury. Okay, thank you, Derek. Um, here's another question from our audience. What is the risk of having a non-certified garment over an appropriately certified garment? You're potentially jeopardizing your whole FR clothing program by having a garment over top of a certified garment. Because by certified, I'm assuming you mean certified to the hazard. I'm assuming that you mean that that garment's been independently certified to be compliant to a particular standard, whether it's NFPA uh, 2112 or, or if it's uh, ASTM 1506 for ARC and, and flash fire accordingly. If you put something over top of it that has, you don't know how it's gonna perform in that hazard, it could nullify the one that is. Uh, so you potentially could be jeopardizing your whole program because what's going to happen and what we see happen, for example, if I put on a non-tested uh, uh, vest over top of my uh, arc rated shirt, that vest could ignite and burn. It doesn't matter what my shirt's gonna do because now I have a big hunk of burning plastic on my chest. That thermal energy is gonna penetrate and cause me injury on my skin. And then secondly, and potentially worse, that's burning on my chest right underneath my breathing apparatus. So when I have to breathe now, I'm breathing inside a fire. 
uh, we definitely don't want that to happen. So take a little bit of time, do the research, get the appropriate uh, layer system so that they're both compliant. Okay. Thanks, Derek. Uh, the next question we have is what provides greater protection, two lightweight layers or a single heavier layer? Once you get them tested, the and I'm going to I'm going to add, I'm going to answer this question in the vast majority of cases, two lightweight arc rated garments are going to be more protective than one heavier weighted garment. With this asterisk, depends on how heavy that heavyweight garment is. Uh, if it's if it's a jacket weight type fabric, it could have 14 to 18 calories of protection, and then those two lightweight blades may not get there. Uh, but in most majorities, if we're talking about shirt weight fabrics, if I'm talking about a seven and a half ounce, eight ounce shirt weight uh, versus a four and a half ounce base layer and a six ounce uh, outer layer, my six ounce and my four and a half ounce in almost all cases uh, is going to be more protective than that seven and a half ounce, eight ounce uh, shirt weight. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question we have um, is, in an arc flash, what is the best form of protection if a break open occurs? Uh, going back to the slide that showed uh, the shirt that did have failure, uh, some, keep, some people would erroneously say that, hey, that shirt didn't work. No, the shirt worked. The shirt was designed to work up to six calories of protection, and you were in a 12-calorie arc, you're going to have fabric failure. You're going to have a shirt like you saw in that picture. So what you wear underneath is going to be critically important. So having two arc rated layers is always going to be better in one versus one arc rated layer, especially if we have break open. Okay. Uh, the next question we have is how many times can a garment be washed before the AR treatment will no longer be effective? Great question. And uh, in this particular case, I can only answer to uh, Bulwark's product line. Bulwark product line, we use a variety of different fabrics. The one thing that all Bulwark fabrics uh, that we utilize have in common is they are flame resistant for the life of that garment. The fabrics themselves will always be flame resistant. They, the flame resistancy within the fabrics is going to exceed the uh, wear life of the garment. So that means that garment is starting to break down as we would through whether it's FR or non-FR, all our garments have a wear life, whatever that may be. Uh, we start to see the seams coming apart. We start to see the knees wearing out. We start to uh, see our, our sleeves wearing out. We start to see the seams coming apart. Be through normal wear and tear. That's what I'm talking about here. Through normal wear and tear, the FR properties for all of Bulwark's garments are going to far exceed what the garment life is. So our guarantee at Bulwark is for the life of that garment. You can't out, outwear the FR technology in all our fabrics. Okay, thanks again, Derek. Uh, our next question comes from William. He asks, uh, do you have any recommendations for personnel working in clean rooms or similar highly controlled environments? Typically, there are product quality slash contamination concerns, and the first suggested control is Tyvek, which would obviously compromise FR clothing. Great, great question. Uh, obviously, we have electrical folks going in, and in many cases, they have to do energized work in order to keep the 
manufacturing process going in a highly controlled environment to where a lot of the fabrics, I think probably all of the fabrics for the most part, worn as shirts, pants, and coveralls are not going to meet their clean room standards. There are companies out there, and Bulwark is not one of them. We do not make uh, F, uh, clean room quality FR garments, but there are companies out there that do. Uh, I, off the top of my head, like Videro, V-I-D-A-R-O, uh, they, Euclid Videro, provide uh, clean room garments that have flame resistant properties. These are designed to be worn over your arc rated FR clothing. They will not melt, drip, add to the injury, but all, all the arc rated work, if there is an incident, is going to be done with your regular shirts, pants, and coveralls, and you would don this type of garment over top of that, if that makes sense. Uh, so there are companies out there that do make arc-rated, flame-resistant bunny suits, arc-rated, flame-resistant uh, garments for clean rooms. Okay, great. Thanks, Derek. Uh, the next question we have is, how is it that all AR clothing is FR, but not all FR clothing is AR? How you get to being ARC rated, in order to go through the testing that gives you what an ARC rating is, first and foremost, you have to be flame resistant. So when we start the process to evaluate a fabric, first and foremost, it has to meet the flame resistancy component. Once it's determined that it's flame resistant, then we want to go the next step and see if it can have an arc rating. Uh, many of the fabrics that uh, Bulwark and others use, use today are flame resistant and are arc rated, obviously. There are some fabrics still in the marketplace today that cannot get an arc rating for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, the FR chemistry that gives it its uh, classification is not durable, meaning it will not last. It can be laundered out. It's temporary. So those fabrics would never get an arc rating. Uh, there's other types of fabrics that uh, won't get an arc rating, but, that, but that's primarily the reason is that in order to get to the arc rating portion of it, you have to be, uh, you need to be durable, flame resistant first and foremost, and then uh, you could take the additional testing. So there are fabrics out there that won't meet that criteria, so hence uh, not all FR garments or FR fabrics, uh, more precisely, can be or are arc rated. Thanks, Derek. I think we have time for one more question. Um, the next one I have is, what is the mandate of OSHA standard 1910-269? 1910-269 is for uh, our utility industry. That's for power generation, transmission distribution, and metering. And that's the law that uh, from a general utility standpoint, that's their sections uh, of OSHA laws. Uh, 1910, excuse me, 1926 is the utility construction uh, side of it. So 1910-269 is specific to power generation, transmission, distribution, and metering. Okay, um, unfortunately that's all the time we have for today. Uh, my thanks to Derek Sang for his presentation, to Bulwark Protective Apparel for sponsoring today's webinar, and to all of our listeners. Please be on the lookout for announcements of future Synergist webinars, and we'll see you soon.